So around the table, we have Carole Juge-Levelin, CEO of June, a beauty and body care brand with 65 employees. Uh, we have uh, Bertrand Altmaier, manager at CD Scoot, uh, an electric mobility service. I'm sure you know and you've seen all the CD Scoot all over the city. Um, 300 employees and almost 300,000 users. Uh, Bertrand, you also co founded Marcel, a uh, mini cab booking platform, uh, which is partner of uh, France Digital uh, today. Twice, yeah, <laughs> so you're twice partner with Marcel and City Scoot. <laughs> well done. Uh, and uh, Sophie Coulot Renouvelle, head of MA, strategic investment and digital at uh, Credit Mutual Arkea. Arkea is a large company, it has uh, 11,000 employees and 4.9 million customers. So um, the, the reason we're having this panel is also because, um, well, not only it is the general theme of the France Digital Day uh, today. And yeah, my name is Frédéric Mazella, but I, since I was on the stage before, I, I, I did not present myself. But uh, and I'm co-president of, uh, of France Digital, and I'm also founder of uh, BlaBlaCar. <coughs> so um, earlier this year, we made interviews with 20 companies. 20 top companies in the ecosystem to create the first guide, which is called the Tech for Values Guide. We made the French version initially, and we're releasing today the English version of the, this uh, Tech for Values Guide. Uh, so 20 firms, including firms like Dr. Lib, Open Classroom, Back Market, uh, which account for 9,000 jobs and 2.8 billion euros in funding and uh, 190 million users. Well, 2.8 billion in billion euros in funding is only what, like twice what was raised yesterday, but uh, <laughs> since <laughs> all the fundraising we had in the ecosystem. But so those 20 companies have raised 2.8 billion in funding. Um, and so we release an English version of this guide, which you can find uh, on the swap card application, which I'm sure you have downloaded, and on techforvalues.com. If you go there, it's a, it's a guide which gives all the best practices of those 20 companies. So uh, we need to attract international talents, which is why we're, we're having this uh, conversation now and which is why we push so much emphasis on, uh, on talent and on the values uh, today. Um, we cannot compete with the other geographies simply on salaries, which is why we rely on purpose and uh, people's quest for meaning. It's a source of attractivity. It's also a source of uh, competitivity. And um, a positioning on values is a, an element of differentiation and attractiveness to recruit uh, our best talent. So we'll be talking about values uh, here uh, in various forms. And I will have a first uh, question uh, for you, Bertrand. If you want, since it's uh, the first time you'll be talking, you can make a short presentation of City School as well and then answer the question. Um, so the question is, why do we have uh, values in our tech ecosystem? Um, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, I, I think you presented City Scoot very well. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we have 7,000 uh, e-mopeds around Europe uh, in five cities uh, that are available for uh, all Europeans. Uh, and we have a particularity in this ecosystem is that we employ everyone that works with us. We don't subcontract to self-employed people. Uh, regarding values, uh, when I started to work, uh, I worked for a financial in institution and I was really struck by the guys I met at the pub uh, bragging about uh, short selling uh, subprimes uh, while they were advising people to buy them. And during the weekend, they were doing some community teamwork with the guy that uh, um, they were actually uh, stealing from. And uh, as soon as, I mean, it took me a few months to understand that uh, personally I needed values to work to go to wake up in the morning. And when I started to become an entrepreneur, um, I brought these values and I, whether, whether it be with Marseille that I founded or with City Scoot that I joined a year ago, values were the key differentiator that I, that I uh, had. And what I understood quickly is that uh, values have a positive return on investment. When you invest on people, uh, eventually on the long run, it has a positive uh, uh, ROI. When you invest, on um, behaving uh, responsibly, you bring value to your brand. So one of the first, uh, the w w what I to sum up, I would say that uh, value on top of being uh, essential to the business and to 
um, to our businesses uh, have a positive and financial return on investment. Okay, have you ever measured that? I guess it's difficult, but you can may maybe have some examples where no value has led to less value. Yeah, well, the example I have is uh, the, the PHV uh, platform that I uh, started. We, uh, we were working with uh, self-employed drivers uh, and retention was really hard, really expensive. Um, our competitors work with subcontractors that maintain the fleet on the street and we know that it's very expensive for them to maintain their subcontractor. And with City Scoot, we work with uh, employees uh, that we listen to, that we uh, train. And uh, we can see that on the long, long run, the financial pro profile of our company is much leaner than our competitors. Thank you. Um, my second question uh, is about um, talent and um, do values help to attract and retain talents in your companies? So it's a question which I could ask to each of you. Maybe we start with you, uh, Sophie, and you, you can also um, represent Arkea if uh, I was too too quick or uh, like not That's totally exact. Greatly done. Thank <laughs> you. And of course, uh, values help hire people. Uh, what we see that uh, youngest people they need meaning. They need to know uh, why they came to work, and they need to have impact. Uh, so values are very important to um, help them understand what you are. And I would say for us as a company to uh, retain them, you have to be very aligned. You have to uh, every day um, uh, give proofs of your values, <laughs> not only by talking, etc., but by being and by engaging in, in business the, the way you speak about your values. So, so what are the values you're thinking about in this context? Uh, uh, I would say um, when you talk about audacity to dare to do things, um, that means uh, you give people the right to, to uh, be wrong sometime and to uh, learn. That's what goes with audacity. Uh, when you speak about uh, being re um, engaged, uh, that means uh, it's not a one action, uh, it's a long-term action, and uh, um, Arkea, Credit Mutual Arkea, gives proof of that, uh, for instance, in the, the way it is investing, and it's important that our actions are aligned with what we do, uh, what we think, and what we uh, say when we talk about values. When was the last time you heard, or you had a discussion like this, with maybe with a colleague? or uh, about the, f the fact that they needed to be aligned, maybe in recruitment or uh, at work, but that they wanted to be aligned between what they live in their personal life and what they do during the day for the, for the company and uh, uh, what, what kind of um, uh, value did they express in, in that context? Um, we are very regular uh, type of a exchanging uh, around this because uh, sometimes it's not easy to understand the alignment and it's very sound to make people, um, uh, to let them explain when they think it's not totally aligned. For instance, there has been a lot of um, um, movement in our company uh, these uh, last two years and it was very important to uh, just stick to our values be able to uh, speak out about it and explain it. That's the reason, uh, that's the context. Uh, we have been ri written the um, uh, 2024 uh, strategic plan. And it's a good way of explaining your values and talking about it and share if we are not totally, we do not totally agree with each other to, to point uh, and to see if the alignment is good or not. Yeah, Carole. And your mic is not working. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I think I, I would I would go on, on the further end and say it takes a lot of commitment every single day with the employees because if you hire someone, they, they usually come for values, but then once they're they're in, they're you know they have demands and you know this is France, so obviously they have lots of demands. Um, but it also takes guts to really um, retain based on values because it's really essential when um, at June, for instance, we have 50% of what 
counts into your performance is performance. 50% is values. And it takes courage, and, and some people could say craziness, to let go of someone who's really performant but doesn't have the right values. And it's something that I've, I've had the unfortunate pleasure of doing. And it's really hard. It's also hard because the law does not recognize values as something that you can fire someone upon. Uh, if you have someone who's really high performance and doesn't have the right values or just moves too far away from the values, then you know the law is not on your side. And so it is something that's, that's hard because uh, hiring people based on values is, is definitely something that makes sense. But retaining and managing based on values is, is a real challenge every single day because is you have to keep that balance. Is, is it linked to, uh, I don't know if you know this scheme, the it's a Jack Welch uh, matrix. Uh, Jack Welch who was the CEO of uh, General Electric for like 20 years. Uh, when the average tenure for a CEO in the US is five years, so when you stay 20 years, usually you you're kind of active. Uh, and so his matrix was, you know, the um, uh, based on two axes, attitude and performance. Mm. So like a good attitude, uh, good performance, good attitude, bad performance, bad attitude, good performance, and bad attitude, bad performance. So of course, if you have someone who's bad attitude, bad performance, I mean, the decision is easy to let them go. Uh, if you have someone with good attitude, good performance, then you, you keep them, of course. Then the two, uh, two uh, question childs, the children, are uh, like the two others, like a good attitude, bad performance, or bad attitude, good performance. You're talking about the bad attitude, good performance. Both, because if you have someone who's really high in values and not performing well, it breaks your heart because you're thinking that person is so aligned with us in terms of values, but just not performing well enough. And so it's always, it, we have the same thing. It's basically a balance. And you imagine a balance with on one side, a dollar sign, and on the other side, a love sign. And so if the performance is really high, but the value is really low, at the end of the day, the scale tilts. The same is true otherwise. If the balance on values is really high, but the performance is very low, the balance tilts. And so your job is to make sure the balance remains flat. And if it goes one way or the other way, you have to kick it up a bit. But it's much easier if someone is underperforming with the right values to help them become better at performance rather than someone who has really poor values. I mean, at some point, an asshole is an asshole. And, you know, you know it's, it's hard to get out of that place. It's a values panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, no, but it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And the conclusion of Jack Welch was that actually uh, if someone has a bad attitude, uh, good or bad performer, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I mean, uh, the, the, the person should not stay for the simple reason that and even more if the person is performing, if he or she has a, a bad attitude, he may be an example for other people because he performs well. So people will think in the company that uh, performing well and behaving that way are linked. And so it may actually transform your culture, uh, which is the reason why you should act quickly if someone doesn't have the right values in your team. Um, so uh, um, let's go to the next, uh, the next question. Uh, my next question is, do you think values bring financial value. Carol again. I'm sure you have something to say on this. Yeah, um, I do. And especially because in, in the business I'm in, so basically we manufacture product for children, uh, diapers and baby care product and, and stuff like that. And against us are amongst the biggest giants in the industry who have sometimes monopoly more than 50% of the entire market, even in Asia. And so when you're up against people like that, if you want to be able to create value for the company, you have to have a very, very strong and uncompromising stance. Otherwise, it's just noise. And being very, very um, attached to the values that we present, transparency, uh, low carbon impact, and, and to have that strong, very strong stance is the only thing, to be honest, that has helped us become who we are, and you know, today we have 3% of the market in France. It's quite small, but because the market's so big, it's actually not that small. And we've only been able to do that because the positioning we have is so strong on values. Otherwise, we would never have been able to do that. So I think it really depends on the industry, 
Um, but in our case, yes, it's so definitely. How do you important. explain the values? I mean, commercially, I mean, in, in for towards your clients, what do you push for? The, the biggest thing we push forward is transparency. We stand behind and we explain every single thing that we do. And because the products that we sell have very often been pointed out by various studies for lacking transparency or sometimes being uh, potentially toxic or harmful, obviously when you're bringing transparency, it changes the game. Because you can only bring transparency with a product on which you can be transparent. The only reason why I'm promoting transparency is because firsthand, I manufactured a product that I was not ashamed to be transparent with. And so it's hard for companies that are much bigger to come in later in the game and say, hi, I want to be transparent, but only with 1% of my range, which is something that right now a lot of large corporations are doing. Like I can be transparent or I can go green on 1% or 5% of my portfolio of product. And obviously that just comes off sometimes with the customers because it, it doesn't feel right. We have this positioning from day one, so of course it's easier for us. Um, and, and yes, it does bring value at the end of the day. It's, it's the only thing that brought us value. Thank you. The, um, maybe we'll go through to, to try to be a bit concrete and on what things can be shared and what things can be reproduced maybe from one company to the next. Um, could you, uh, each of you, share the, your top social or environmental best practices, let's say the, your top three, if you have three to share. Uh, maybe Bertrand, we'll, we'll begin with you. Uh, do you have like some best practices yeah. to yeah, share? Yeah. Um, the difficulty we have at City Scouts is that uh, we are seen as a company with value by design because we provide um, a, a traveling um, service that lower the car carbon footprint uh, of the city. But if you do so, behaving uh, badly while you operate, uh, while you hire people, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, cont counterproductive. So what we, we have decided to do, on top of uh, um, a carbon uh, bilan um, uh, review of our activity, um, is to... <coughs> um, sorry. Is, is, to, um, is to make sure that on every uh, single leg uh, of our table, we behave correctly. So for instance, in operations, we only use uh, green uh, electric vehicles to maintain the, the scooters. Uh, we employ people, as I was mentioning, we don't uh, hire su subcontractors. And what we've done recently also is every time we buy something, uh, the carbon footprint of um, what we are buying is a key element, a key differentiator, as well as the price of what we buy. Uh, how do you? How is it articulated that it's a key differentiator? Is it like you make a grid and you, you yeah. base your decision on this? There's a committee of people choosing the well, wh wh what you will buy. How does that work? We don't have enough people, unfortunately, to have committees Committee. to, to to buy things. But yeah, it's part of the the, the buying process. We um, we you put points. Yeah, exactly. Know, the price, exactly. and you put points on uh, and, and best practices. And on top of that, the, um, a, a product that is badly valued uh, in terms of uh, carbon footprint is uh, of the... How the do table. you know? Is it a data which is easy to obtain, like the carbon footprint of, the of what the you buy? I mean, it, it, it depends... Um, it comes back to transparency. And ex exactly. We, we mostly buy uh, mopeds, so and we buy a lot of them, so we have very uh, close relationship with our suppliers, which means that it's much easier for us to... Uh, uh, you to know the companies. Uh, yeah, very like well. We, we welcome them. you visited them, uh, you, yeah, you exactly. know how they yeah. operate. and Exactly. They let you go in the companies to and they show you how they do. And well, unfortunately, I, I joined the company just uh, on the 11th of May 2020, so just uh, yeah. after the, the first lockdown. So I didn't have the chance to do so, but yeah, the, the founder, I think he's around his has done so uh, many, many times, uh, and the moped is is uh, is built in, in Europe. Uh, uh -huh. And this, this was a, a very important thing for uh, when we launched the service. Okay, uh, what about you, uh, Sophie, maybe yeah. at... Uh, Talking about yeah. carbon print uh, is a good way to, to ex have proofs uh, about values. Um, after the COVID, uh, of course, the teleworking has been a, 
very uh, large, and uh, we promote uh, teleworking for carbon print um, uh, reduction with two days of teleworking uh, in areas where we wouldn't have been thinking of, uh, about it uh, before COVID. And now, for carbon footprint impact and for a work and a life balance, it seems to be a very, very good idea to, to promote it. We changed also the way of um, uh, uh, traveling, uh, making it, um, uh, having it uh, very, uh, well, transforming um, uh, flight uh, in train uh, out of uh, two out of three um, uh, travels. Uh, so the we encourage company. it. Like everybody in the company, like two, two, two out of three of the trips which were, ma yes. which were made before it by airplane are now down by that's train. That's uh, what the purpose uh -huh. and uh, uh, regarding uh, when, we, when we travel, it's also related to work. So um, we are changing the way of um, making uh, meetings, not to begin at nine o'clock, for instance, because it's not possible in train to begin at nine o'clock. So we, we are changing the way of scheduling to make uh, it possible. And it's very concrete. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it is, it is. And so, uh, out of the uh, eleven thousand employees, so um, how has it been uh, accepted, like um, by everybody? Well, how was it maybe debated internally, uh, exposed as reasons why you were moving in that direction? That, uh, how was it decided mm -hmm. in the first place? Uh, For the teleworking uh, subject, it has been uh, decided uh, talking with all the HR. Um, uh, of all the subsidiaries, uh, so to have a, um, a common way of thinking about it. Of course, so some of the subsidiaries, they can do um, teleworking five days a week, it's possible, but for a um, bigger company, we think it's important to see each other, and so today's came as a, a consensus. For uh, the purpose of traveling, it's more like it's it's a pop it's um, uh, the vision. Uh, it's not compulsory if you have to uh, travel by flight and you, you can do otherwise. Then uh, it's okay too. So it means you have a counter for this as well. Is there like yes. a quota per person? Is that no? How do uh, like very concrete? Uh, it's uh, it uh, it's a long yeah, time now that we have a um, um, carbon um, survey. And uh, we, we count all these things, all the HR and their RSO uh, ambassadors, they count it. We have, uh, well, we have um, tools to do it so, to com so as to compare. 2020 was absolutely uh, abnormal, but uh <laughs> we have other years of comparison. The new standard? <laughs> <laughs> it will be tough to beat. Um, Carole, in your company uh, at June, uh, what are your best um, practices? We do three. Uh, so if you want three, I have, I have good three. The first one is we measure the impact on a bi-monthly basis. So every two weeks, all the employees at June get a survey by email asking the same eight questions, including how are we aligned with our values and how do you feel in the company and so on and so forth. Because measuring... Quite often, I think the the mindset and the mood of everyone who's working is also a really good way of ensuring that everyone is aligned and everyone feels good and everyone you know is feels challenged at the company. Um, the second thing we do, we have one employee full time who's doing only regulations and corporate social responsibility. So she's in charge of very like many different things. She's going to. Um, promote, for instance, a uh, project, um, like we changed very recently uh, all the uh, shipping in large cities to um, green shipping. So everything is done by electric um, uh, vehicles that don't resume on thermal fuel. Um, but she's always going to promote ideas and projects like that. And it's really important to have someone who always voices that regardless of any financial aspect because she's very independent. We, so basically she's the in-house cop for green and that I think that's really important. It shows commitment and it really helps educate the rest of the team. And the third thing we do... Is she dressed specially? Or no, like she's no? dressed normally. She's not um, dressed in green every day? Or no, something. she does have no. a dog though because <laughs> we do have dogs at the office. Um, but no, she's, she's, she's very committed and it's, it really helps 
because she talks to everyone at the company, whether it's C level or or any any junior on the floor, and she talks to everyone about always the same the same thing. So it's always really important to have that. Um, and the last thing we do, and it, I think it's also important, we have, so it's not really a foundation because having a foundation in France is really costly. So we have a, uh, a fund that generates, you know, offers and, and, and supports lots of um, um, nonprofit organization because it's also part of what we do. We want to be close to all the families, obviously those who can afford it, but also those who can't. And being able to give back, I think, is also very coherent to the values and to be able to do so in a very, very speedy manner. This summer, we were all on vacation when Afghanistan fell and we got calls to deliver diapers and baby products. And in two days, we delivered very quickly. And it's also part of, it doesn't generate any business whatsoever and we don't communicate about it, but it's also part of what makes the employees feel like it's not bullshit. It's who we are, and it really shows in everything they do, and it's important for them and for me, obviously. Great, thank you very much. So this is uh, actually the end of uh, of our uh, panel. Um, thank you very much for sharing all this. Uh, if you also want some more best practices, uh, well, this is the uh, again the uh, the goal of the guide that we have produced, which is called the Tech for Values Guide 2021 which will be diffused. It's available right now for download, uh, totally free, of course, uh, to showcase what the companies in our ecosystem do, uh, do very well. well you, you, your two companies are in the, uh, in the guide. Um, and so, uh, it's because it's startups, it's mostly uh, targeted towards startups, which is the reason why uh, Arkea is like supporting the guide uh, and showing all the, the best practices as well, but um, the, uh, among the 20 startups, uh, we, we find Cities Good on June. And so you'll find all the best practices, which we hope will spread in the ecosystem because they are really, uh, um, they're really things which deserve to be, uh, to be replicated, to create, to contribute, to create a, actually the, a better future for us and to align our personal convictions and our professional lives, which is, uh, the, the major point maybe to be to be happy. Thank you very much. And now we will have a panel on edtech with Chris